Hello and welcome. Today, gems from the huge catalogue of CBS, Columbia, Latterly, Sony Records. A huge American recording company, but the picture is complicated for those of us who like to listen to our classical music on vinyl. And that is because it is more or less universally acknowledged that the quality of these record pressings really does not match up with the quality of uh, European counterparts like Decca, EMI, even Philips. It's such a shame because these recordings, many of them are absolutely glorious. Now, some collectors are happy to say, okay, you get the early 6i or 2i pressings. Many of these early pressings are still mastered using tubes, so they have that extra warmth. But as we transition into the transistor age, that warmth goes away. You also have a problem of a, of a highly variable quality of the vinyl itself. So even these early pressings, the vinyl itself is kind of noisy. Now this only gets worse as you move into the era of the, the 70s and 80s. These later pressings, the sound is not great. It's no match for the classic recordings on Decca, EMI, and certainly the early RCA living stereos. Now, the interesting thing is that in the last 10 years, Sony has been aggressively remastering a lot of its catalogue, sometimes for individual releases, sometimes for these huge box sets, and all of a sudden we're hearing just how good these recordings are. Really, really good. Uh, right now I'm listening to the huge box that came out of Eugene Ormandy's early mono recordings with the Philadelphia Orchestra, and they are a revelation, both in terms of performance and sound. I was not overly familiar with Ormandy's catalogue. I guess like many Europeans, I tend to dismiss him as a bit of a flashy conductor, you know, just all about surface glitter. Well, these early mono recordings are putting me to rights. They are extraordinary, sensational, thrilling to listen to, even though they are recorded in mono. And at a later date, I will be doing a video on that box set amongst others. Anyway, back to the records. I'm going to pick some really choice ones, ones that I, I just love. And I will talk as I go about the different versions and whether you want to go for the CD version. But even given the fact that vinyl is often lacking in these CBS records, um, there's still plenty for the collector, the lover of classical music to find in the used bins or in certain uh, reissues and discover great music and great performances. Now, I'm going to start with this monster. <laughs> Let's see, pick this up here. This is really something of its time. So you look at it, you'd have no idea what it is, but then you look on there and you see it is the complete Beethoven Nine Symphonies, conducted by one of the most important conductors of the 20th century, and certainly one of the most important conductors in the early days of the Columbia catalog going up to his death. Uh, in the early 60s. These are performances by Bruno Walter with the Columbia uh, Symphony Orchestra, which was essentially a, a scratch orchestra put together specifically for the recording studio. This is a really lovely set. I had wanted to get a copy of this for some time and it, it took me a while. This one is not perfect, but it's, it's pretty good. Now you can find this in the earlier 6i pressing, but hard to find that in good condition. This is the grey label 2i pressing, and actually I have found in general these 2i's are very acceptable, very nice sounding. The trouble with the, the 6i's is just that it, it's hard to find a clean copy. This also comes with this wonderful book. It's so much of its period. It's just full, full of wonderful photos, illustrations, commentary on the performances, on the symphonies. It's worth getting almost for the book alone, and it's kind of like a, a time travel. 
you've got extracts from Beethoven's writings, you've got musical extracts from the symphonies to try and give you an orientation towards how they're put together, wonderful essays. It's so much fun. I mean, you do not get this with downloads. This is one of the joy of records, these box sets with these <laughs> fantastic booklets. As to the, the performances, now I grew up on very definitely the European mainstays. So we're talking about Carrie Ann's 1963 cycle and later ones and certainly some of the period instrument performances. But I, my father did have a couple of Bruno Walter records in his collection. So very early on, I was used to hearing his Mozart in particular. So I come to these performances later in life and I have to say, I absolutely love them. They are beautifully recorded. They are mainstream performances, but he really gets Beethoven's idiom, his soul. Some of these recordings have been reissued individually by Speaker's Corner and Classic Records. I have some of those and you can look them up on Discogs. They are certainly superior sounding because they've been mastered beautifully all from the original tapes using analog gear. But there's something really fun about having this complete set. It would be really nice if one of the reissue companies did put together the whole set like this and reproduced it perfectly. But I suspect that, that won't happen. It would be very expensive. Bruno Walter is a true link to the past. I mean, he started conducting as a young man and worked with Gustav Mahler. He actually led the premieres of Mahler's two late works, Das Lied von der Erde and the Ninth Symphony. So there is this direct link back to the European tradition of, of music and performance. And his Mahler performances are, are essential listening for anyone interested in that composer. But staying with the Beethoven, these are wonderful, along with his performances of Brahms and Mozart, central to the repertoire. If you can manage to find a decent copy, <laughs> here we are, picking this huge thing up again, pick this up. It's really fun and it's a wonderful thing to have in your library. Moving on to the conductor who was central to the CBS catalog. And I'm talking about Leonard Bernstein at the New York Philharmonic and various other orchestras that he recorded with occasionally. Leonard Bernstein, what an extraordinary musician. I mean, a truly original composer, a fantastic teacher. I mean, he did so much to bring classical music into the lives of regular folks through his television programs, through his radio broadcasts. And then he was a superb conductor and he actually lamented the fact that the success of his conducting career impinged on his ability to spend as much time composing as, as he wanted. But I mean, if he was remembered only for West Side Story, that would be enough. A show that really reinvented Broadway, what the Broadway musical was. But his classical compositions are gaining more and more traction in the concert hall and on recordings. And we're starting to see more and more how interesting his own works were. But today we're going to talk mainly about his conducting. And boy, was he great. Now, latterly in his career, he conducted exclusively for Deutsche Grammophon and recorded almost entirely live concerts, mainly with the Vienna Philharmonic, to some degree with the Israel Philharmonic. However, in his early career, of course, he burst onto the scene because he had to fill in at a concert and it was a huge success and that was it. He was off and running. He was the principal conductor of the New York Philharmonic and the catalog of their recordings together is full of wonderful wonderful performances. And as we're starting to hear in these uh, CD remasterings, really great recordings. I'm going to start off with just a few records that I think are special. Now this first one is not actually with the New York Philharmonic, but this was a very important record. This is of the Danish composer Carl Nielsen's Third Symphony, 
And I think there's a really good argument for saying that this was the record that got people starting to pay attention to Carl Nielsen, who today is, is put up there with many of the great symphonists of the 20th century, like John Sibelius. This recording with the Royal Danish Orchestra is really, really exciting. And this pressing I have, I believe, yes, it's a 2i. This was a recording that just blew people away. And the reviews were fantastic. And he went on to record more of the Nielsen symphonic oeuvre. But this is the one to start with. And actually, this record sounds really good, my copy of it, anyway. Now, here's another, I think, of Bernstein's best records, although not many people know about it, and they don't know about it apart because the piece itself is not done very often. And that is Stravinsky's Oedipus Rex. This is a really tricky work to do. I mean, you've got the original source material, which is a... St I mean, it's Greek drama, so it's very stylized, and... The libretto is by the great French filmmaker, poet Jean Cocteau, and then it's translated back into Latin, and it's written in this very stylized way of setting the words. Stravinsky doing his stepping back, uh, almost a sense of alienation, daring you to get emotionally involved, but this performance works so well. Hard to find. I will tell you right away that it's a later CBS pressing. It Again, it's like those later pressings. It's not the best sonically, but relief is at hand. Uh, Sony just recently released all of Bernstein's Stravinsky recordings in a very uh, well-priced CD set. I think it costs like around $35 or so on Amazon, and it includes this. Most people think this recording is probably the best, certainly one of the best recordings of this work. I love it. I, I bought this when it came out. Uh, like everyone else, I had trouble getting into the piece, but this was the performance that really started to reveal the piece to me. It's an overlooked work of Stravinsky and deserves to be heard much more. And this recording is one of the very best. Now, the composer people identify so closely with Leonard Bernstein is Gustav Mahler. And his complete cycle of recordings from the New York Philharmonic are essential listings. But I've picked something a little different. This is his recording of the second symphony, the Resurrection Symphony, massive piece for huge orchestra, chorus, soloists. And this is actually a recording from the early 70s made with the London Symphony Orchestra. Bernstein conducted with them quite regularly. And it's recorded at Ely Cathedral. And I've picked this because this was the performance that introduced me to Mahler. This performance was broadcast on television in England, and I watched that very first broadcast. It was the first time I had heard Mahler's music. I must have been around 12 or 13 at the time. And it was the first time that I had seen Bernstein conducting. I knew West Side Story. I loved the music, but I'd never seen or really listened to any of his classical recordings. So I watched this, and I was absolutely mesmerized. It's a thrilling performance. Now, if you go online and read reviews of this, you're going to come across a lot of criticism for the sound. Well, here's the deal. It was recorded in a cathedral, so the reverberation time is enormous. But it doesn't matter to me. If you, I actually dug this out. I cleaned up the records a few years ago and put them on. And I was amazed, actually, at how good the sound was. This is an English pressing. Yes, there's huge reverberation time. But I think the engineers did a pretty good job of conquering that. And I have to say, I, I find this actually a more exciting, thrilling performance than the one he recorded just a few years earlier with the New York Philharmonic in the studio. 
the other thing that's great about this is you have uh, two wonderful soloists, including, I mean, Janet Baker. Her singing of her solos is just mesmerizing. And also the great Sheila Armstrong. You can catch this on YouTube. And if you want to see Lee Bernstein in full flight, he was well known for just almost acting out the music as he conducted it. And this is just a, a mesmerizing thing to watch as well as listen to. Funny thing is that I have a friend who's an actor here in Los Angeles and his father was one of the trumpet players in the orchestra at this time. And I told him about this recording and he didn't know about it and he went online and, and then he sent me an email and said, oh my God, this is so exciting. I can see my father playing in the orchestra over and over. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is really special to me. It's not for everyone, but boy, oh boy, I, for those of you who've shied away from this because of its reputation, you might want to give it a go. Now, of course, it's impossible to pick just a couple of records representative of Leonard Bernstein's career in the recording studio on CBS alone. Uh, he's a major figure in 20th century music, a major conductor, and of course, later on, I will be doing some videos devoted just to him, as I will be doing videos about other conductors and musicians. But before I left him today, I wanted to mention two other records. First is this one up here of uh, Debussy, recorded with a New York Phil. I featured this in an earlier video. It's a lovely recording of beautiful music, including the Prelude à l'Apremie d'une Fon. It's the reissue on Speaker's Corner. Speaker's Corner recently, one in the last few years, has done a number of beautiful reissues of records from the CBS catalogue. And thank God they did. Uh, there are, <laughs> the original vinyl is just not so good. But their reissues done all analog sound wonderful and the vinyl is dead quiet. And if you want to go for something that's really warm and inviting, beautiful music, I highly recommend this. There are a number of the Leonard Bernstein records that uh, Speaker's Corner have done. Some of them are out of print now, but I, you shouldn't have to pay too much money on the used market. I'm sure you can find them. I did also want to mention uh, some of Bernstein's own music. He was a brilliant composer and more and more people are starting to see how brilliant his music is, even the more so-called conventional classical music. But I'm picking out this CD collection. This is of a variety of his music. All of these are available on vinyl. But there's a particular reason why I've chosen this CD. This is from a whole group of CDs that were put out by CBS, oh, some 20 years ago, something like that, remastered. And I'm mentioning this in particular because it has one of my absolute favorite Leonard Bernstein pieces. And that is the Prelude Fugan Riffs, which was written for a jazz ensemble and is recorded here by Benny Goodman. Now, the reason I'm particularly picking out this CD issue is the original record, any original record you find of this work had extra reverberation added to the recording. It was something they often did on CBS records. God knows why. I guess they meant, felt it made it some more, I don't know, natural, inviting. Who knows? But for this CD issue, they took out that extra reverberation and this recording is smoking white hot. It is so exciting. Also on this CD, other really brilliant music by him. Three dance episodes from On the Town, the Fancy Free Ballet, and the Serenade after Plato's uh, Symposium. It's a major work he wrote for violin. And this is the recording with uh, Francescati, is the violinist, uh, a really great violinist. So if you want to hear this music, skip the vinyl, try and find the CD. You should be able to find it in the used bins. One of the things that I simply do not understand, Sony has been doing these fantastic box set reissues of their core repertory artists. 
and they've been doing the best job, I think, of any of the companies doing these reissues. They did a beautiful box of Bruno Walter. I'm currently listening to the most recent box of Eugene Ormondy, the mono recordings done with the Philadelphia Orchestra, which are a revelation and thrilling. But we had the Bernstein centenary recently, a year or two ago, and what did they do? They, they put out a box of his recordings, but it wasn't everything. It was just sort of cherry-picked highlights. They had previously done these various other boxes, bits of pieces here, bits of pieces there, all very nicely remastered. But my God, guys, I cannot believe for the centenary that you didn't put out the proper complete edition, especially when they've done their other artists so proud. So please, Sony, soon, can you do a proper complete Leonard Bernstein edition. In the meantime, there are some wonderful smaller box sets, the set of his Beethoven recordings for CBS, his recordings of Sibelius, his recordings of Stravinsky I already mentioned. These are all available at a pretty cheap price and they sound terrific. So I think the other most important conductor on the CBS label after the three I've mentioned already is Pierre Boulez. And it's so interesting that he ended up having this huge career as a conductor, often of relatively mainstream repertoire, albeit uh, late 19th, 20th century repertoire. Pierre Boulez was the enfant terrible of modern music. He was part of a group of composers who just rejected tonality, were hardcore serialists. They made uh, tough music difficult music to listen to. I mean, his great breakthrough work, Le Mato Son Maître, it's a hard listen. I actually saw one of his other works, uh, Plea Sen en Plea, done as a ballet, and it was actually much, made much more sense seeing it as a ballet, where you had the rhythms and patterns of the dancers imposing on the music a structure that made it easier to understand the music. Now, I've actually come to like Boulez's music quite a bit, and I heard him conduct a lot of it at different times, but that's a whole other story. So with Boulez, we then have this unlikely spectacle of him becoming a very successful, internationally renowned conductor, conducting everything from Haydn and Mahler and Bruckner, believe it or not, through to more modern music by people like Messiaen, and certainly taking in Bartok, Ravel, Debussy. So he begins his formal conducting career with CBS, and as well as performing and recording more out-of-the-way music, I mean, back at this time in the 60s and 70s, composers like Weber, and it was still hardly performed. I mean, they're hardly performed today, but he recorded all of Weber's works. But along with that stuff, the more difficult esoteric stuff and recordings of his own music, he starts to record more mainstream repertoire. And I have to say, I love these records. I'm going to show you a couple of them now. One of his specialties is Bartok. And this record of the miraculous Mandarin is still my favorite to this day. It's a blistering performance and recording terrifying. He captures all the savagery and violence of the score. It's a complete thrill to listen to, and it's coupled with, people often forget this, it's coupled with uh, the dance suite in a beautiful recording. Now, you've got the problem of pressings of this. All these Boulez uh, records are later pressings. They're really, none of them really terrific. Um, even if the pressing isn't bad, the vinyl is somewhat noisy, even after you've cleaned it on a proper machine. But I got a few of these as I was growing up in England in British pressings, and in general I think the British pressings don't sound too bad at all. Now, if you want to hear that Bartok record in the sound that it deserves, there's a small English label, independent label, called Dutton Laboratories, and they have been going into the CVS catalogue and reissuing, remastering records which were recorded for quadraphonic. That was a sort of early version of surround sound. And what Dutton has done is they've remastered these in high res, two channel, 
and surround on combination CD, SACD. And one of the recordings you can find is that Bartok Miraculous Mandarin. And boy, does it sound great. So even if you can't find a decent regular record copy, you can find it on that excellent Dutton Laboratories CD, SACD remastering. Now, one of the tricks that the record labels did towards the end of the analog era as we were moving into digital recording and then eventually CDs, one of the things they did to try and lure customers into continuing to buy vinyl was they started to issue so-called audiophile uh, editions of their records. And in CBS's case, they started to do these half-speed masterings. Now, over the years and right into the present, half-speed mastering is one of those gimmicks that a number of companies have tried in terms of trying to improve the sound, create a more audiophile sound. I mean, right now in the realm of pop music, you've got Abbey Road Studios doing all these half-speed masterings of really central rock and roll titles. For example, Brian Eno's catalog and I have to say, I haven't really heard any of these, but the reviews have not been too friendly. And the sort of general opinion on these earlier half-speed masterings done by CBS is that they're not very good. Well, I'm not sure I agree with that. I recently was in one of my regular used record stores and I came across a bunch of these half-speed mastered issues put out by CBS. And I thought, oh, I'll give these a try. And I was blown away. Now, one of these records is this. Boulez's recording of a Firebird. He recorded a Firebird for CBS. He also went on to record it later on uh, when he re-recorded pretty much everything for Deutsche Grammophon. But I love these early CBS recordings. And this half-speed mastered version is brilliant to listen to. It has become almost my favorite recording now, uh, along with the classic Durati recording on Mercury, which is still probably is, is the best sonically. But this comes really close. And what you get with Boulez, he was a master in letting all the detail come through. He paid such attention to the balance in the orchestra and making sure all these little details came through that you hadn't heard before. And then when you've got such a good recording and so well mastered, I don't really care how they did it, uh, it sounds fantastic. And again, it indicates that what's on the original master tapes is so much better than what we all thought from our crappy <laughs> records. Oh, CBS, how, how did you manage to do this? How did you manage to put out such inferior vinyl, all these fantastic recordings? Well, thank God now with the way CD remasters are being done and increasingly high res and a SACD, we can finally hear how great these recordings are. And here's one we can actually put on a record and hear how great it is. This is terrific. You can find it online used. You can sometimes find it in a store like I did. I picked up a whole bunch of these and I'll talk about them in subsequent videos. Highly recommended. So some years ago, uh, I was visiting England and I always tried to pop down to London and go to one of my favorite used classical record stores, which alas is no longer there, Harold Moore's Records. And they had this basement just full to bursting of fantastic records, rare stuff you couldn't necessarily find. Oh my God, I, I remember on one occasion I went in there and I went over to their jazz section and they'd just gotten in a private collection and it was all the original early uh, Miles Davis quintet, first quintet performances on Prestige, but in first European UK pressings, different artwork, Oh my God, I won't even tell you how much money they were asking for them. Anyway, one time I was in there and I'd, I'd become friends with the guy who ran the record section over the years. Sometimes I would call him up from LA and say, do you have such and such and such and such? And he said, oh yeah, yeah I have that. I'll, I'll send you a copy. Anyway, I was in there and he said, 
so are you into chamber music? And I said, oh yeah, absolutely. He said, well, do you know about the Budapest String Quartet? And I said, well, I know of them. I've never really listened to any of their records. And he said, well, look, I just got a bunch of these in. I haven't even put them out yet. Uh, come and take a look. And, you know, I think they're amongst the very best quartet performances of their era. I mean, the Budapest Quartet was active basically from like the teens of the 20th century through to like 1965 to 70 something like that they had some changes of personnel i mean they are one of the great string quartets so he plucked out these records and i took a look and i bought a bunch of them got them home to the states cleaned them up on my vacuum machine wonderful i just love these records. I've got a bunch of the Beethoven recordings and then this one of the Debussy and Ravel quartets. This is just lovely. I mean great quartet playing is great quartet playing of any era and this is one of my favorite groups that I've heard and even though it's a later pressing this one sounds very good indeed. My other ones are earlier pressings. That's the thing with CBS Records. Even on a late pressing like that, you can find a copy that really sounds very good. It's just hit and miss. You just have to go through the agony of buying something and, and then see if, if it sounds any good. Anyway, Debussy and Ravel, the Budapest Quartet. I know that Sony has been reissuing a number of recordings by these guys on CD. If you just want to go for one of those box sets, go for it. I've even thought of picking up some of them myself. Wonderful stuff. Shifting gears again to modern music. This huge masterpiece of 20th century music, the Tarangalila Symphony. Now look, there are lots of really great recordings of this. And on vinyl, I mean, my absolute favorite is the Andre Previn recording. I will be featuring that in a later video talking about Previn's records. But I wanted to show this. This is a recording done by Esape Kasalanen, who for many years was the music director of the LA Phil here in Los Angeles. I went to many of his concerts. I think he was always best in certain 19th century and certainly 20th century repertory. Not so good in the traditional classics. I had friends in the orchestra, some of whom enjoyed playing with him although by the time of his tenure, most of them were ready for a change. But I'm grateful for going to concerts where he did repertoire I never would have heard live anywhere else without waiting for a long time. I love this recording of the Tarangalila Symphony. Uh, it's beautifully recorded. Um, I also have it on CD. The CD sounds terrific. Like I said, the Previn version is, is my go-to. And then there's also a, uh, a couple of more recent recordings, one on SACD, which are really excellent. But I love this, and I, I used this in a radio drama uh, for background music, and it worked beautifully. Really like this performance. And I thought I'd finish on a lighter note with another star of the more recent CBS Sony catalogue, and that is this guy. Michael Tilson Thomas. Look how young he is here. For many years conductor of the San Francisco Symphony where he started their own record label. Back when I worked in radio and public radio I produced a series of concerts of his. In the summer he would take over the Pittsburgh Symphony and they would come to this outdoor arena called Great Woods near Boston and we recorded all their concerts and put them on the air with interviews and commentary, etc. And he was just a pleasure to work with. A formidable musician, one of the most important modern American musicians, in many ways kind of took over from Bernstein in some respects. Uh, he's also a composer. Nowadays he's wanting to compose more. He just stepped down from the San Francisco Symphony. <laughs> And funnily enough, Esabeka Salonen has just taken over at the San Francisco Symphony after being in London with the Philharmonia for many years. This is so much fun. It's just doing all these Gershwin overtures, completely idiomatic, a wonderful blend of Broadway and the classical world. 
and Tilson Thomas just can, can conduct this with his eyes shut. This is again one of these CBS Half Speed Mastered reissues. It sounds so much more clear than the original version and the vinyl of course is so much better. Highly recommended and I you may have noticed I also have one of his other records up here of Gershwin. Uh, this is doing um, the original version of A Rhapsody in Blue. That's with a, a smaller band. And then we've also got the second Rhapsody for orchestra with piano and various unpublished piano works and all of this with Tilson Thomas himself sitting at the piano. He's done a number of recordings of Rhapsody in Blue and the different versions of Rhapsody in Blue. They're all great and uh, I'm a fan of his. I really enjoy his work. He's just a very exciting conductor and interesting also like Bernstein, a great Mahler conductor. A few years ago before the pandemic I heard him conduct the San Francisco Symphony in Disney Hall in Mahler's fifth and it was unbelievable. It was such an exciting performance and of course Disney Hall has these tremendous acoustics. It's, it's a wonderful hall to go and hear music in, especially big works like that where you can hear every detail and the hall doesn't sort of get overcome when it gets too loud, which happens in some halls. Anyway, that's the end of this uh, series of gems from the CBS uh, catalog. I will be doing more of these in the future and certainly more on conductors like Bruno Walter, Eugene Ormandy and the great Lenny Bernstein. What a musician. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I'm always grateful for any comments, likes and do subscribe if you're enjoying all these videos. I'm certainly enjoying doing them. Many thanks for watching and until we meet again, happy listening.